comrades. Look, what a conference have we had. It would have been unbelievable only a few years ago, the policies that we have rolled out, the motions that we have passed on Palestine and on... <laughs> and some of our policies on the economy, some of our policies on home affairs, they are unbeatable. And now we are here to hopefully continue that fight because it does not finish here. 40 years ago, the Socialist Campaign Group was set up by Tony Benn. It, it was set up to not only start to put socialist ideas into the party, but to try and challenge the party for leadership positions, something that you have enabled us to do. And in that time, many of our colleagues and comrades that you will hear tonight have been toiling in the cold quite literally in a little room sometimes in Westminster, and it has seemed very lonely. How different it is tonight. How different it is now in the Labour Party. So, I am going to hand over to a number of our amazing colleagues who will address you throughout the evening, and we hope will inspire you with a bit more socialism, if you can cope with it. <laughs> and we'll make sure that we go fighting in to a new election for a socialist government led by Jeremy Corbyn. First on tonight, I've got Emma Denkote. Now, Emma is one of my new colleagues who joined... <laughs> who joined in that amazing election and only a few days later had to cope with something absolutely tragic in her constituency, but something that I know has strengthened her resolve to fight for justice. Emma. Thank you very much, Lloyd, and, and thanks to all of you and all of those in No Hope constituencies. If you can do it in Kensington, you can do it anywhere. Yeah, the Tories are still in shock. They really hate me. Badge of honour. Badge of honour. <laughs> yeah. I'm hoping before I begin to speak that um, my friend Potent Whisper, he's a spoken word poet. Um, yeah, you know him. He's got a new, a new um, a poem coming out, a rhyme coming out to, tonight. Rhyming Guide to Austerity. Please have a look at it a bit later at Potent Official. It's absolutely blinding. He gave me a private performance a couple of weeks back. It's just staggeringly good. And he gets all the details right, as well as being an incredible poet. So I want to give you a little hi highlight of my last couple of days. So uh, on Saturday, I spoke at Labour, Labour Leading Women, why the Labour Party needs socialist women. On Sunday, I spoke at CND with our Shadow Minister for Peace. How cool is that we've got a Shadow Minister for Peace? <laughs> on Monday, I spoke at the Labour Representation Committee about Labour's readiness for power. Yeah. <laughs> I've just spoken at the Socialist Health Association, and I'm rushing off shortly to speak very respectfully, of course, about the royal family, at Labour for Republic, about making republicanism a part of socialism. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
There's a few Republicans that are here tonight, I can tell. Don't be silent about it. Speak out, please. I can't be the only one. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> So I remember a few years ago, I asked, I've been a councillor for 12 years, asking a fellow councillor quietly, are we allowed to say we're socialists in public? I'm not really sure. It was kind of, some kind of guilty secret, a bit like being a Republican, really. Um, so, you know, now how, how the tables have turned, we can use that, that term loud and clear, and we're not embarrassed about it anymore. So, <laughs> um, I'm not a career politician, not really, I've had other things in my life, um, but um, I've been asked many times over the years if I wanted to be an MP, and I always said, well, I live in Kensington, what's the point? I would never stand anywhere else, this is my patch, born and bred here, um, and uh, I'd only ever stand here, and it would be pointless, but time, time's changed, time's changed. Um, I would never have stood under any other Labour leader than the one we have now. So I stuck it out through the dark years, um, yeah, I, I need a badge for that actually, I stuck it out under all, I, I campaigned for Blair, it was awful, I got chased down the street, but I did it, I stuck it out, I know not everybody did, and respect for them too, but I did stick it out, um, and thinking about it, 2017, under Jeremy, it gave, me, it gave me that one chance of my life actually, to have, yeah, I'll have a go, I'll give the Tories a scare, <laughs> it worked, didn't it, it really worked, so I went for it, and, and we, we made history. And some of my colleagues are here tonight. Thank you, Kensington. Just for the record, Kensington CLP increased five times after Jeremy, so, yeah. <laughs> so, four days, four days after my election, the av entirely avoidable atrocity of Grenfell Tower devastated our community. 16 months later, people are still homeless. And whatever figures they say publicly, it's double that because I work with the people, it's shameful. Mm -hmm. Cladding made of solid petrol is still legal. Uh, people living in ACM clad homes live in fear. <clears throat> when it happened, I thought Grenfell Tower would be the bonfire of neoliberalism. So let's ensure it is. Yeah. <laughs> So one of, our, one of my uh, fellow constituents, as he was then, the fantastic Tony Benn, used to come out campaigning with us. He said, we are not here to manage capitalism, but to change society and to define its finer values. That's what I want to do. So let's ensure, let's make this happen. Let's keep people safe in their homes. Let's house the homeless. And let's have a general election and return a socialist government now. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. <coughs> Our next speaker really doesn't need much of an introduction. What I would say is that many years ago, um, I was frustrated that we didn't have a socialist voice in the Labour Party. And I joined a little group called the Labour Representation Committee. And uh, we set up a youth network called the Socialist Youth Network. And at a founding conference, this man came along and he helped inspire my journey to be determined for socialism in Britain. That man is our next Chancellor, John McDonnell. Thanks, thanks, Rob. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Okay. There's lots of We can't. <laughs> There's lots of speakers. We can't go on these standing ovations. It's ridiculous. Yeah. And we're not into it anyway. We're not into it. Yeah. There's no sense of triumphalism. Oh, yes, there is. <laughs> The, um, 
Way back when the campaign group was founded all those years ago, um, I was a, an activist supporting the campaign group, organising their meetings, etc., and their publications and stuff like that, um, before, whilst I was an activist and on the GLC too. Uh, and Tony Ben, I just wish Tony Ben was here. I just wish he was. Um, what he, way back in the early 80s when we were campaigning around the nature of the manifesto for the 83 election, um, one of the expressions that was used continuously, largely drafted by Tony Benn, is that what the Labour Party about, is about is an, to achieve an irreversible shift in the balance of power and wealth in favour of working people. That's what we're about to do. That's what we're about to do. We're going to... And the way in which we're, we're going to do it, we've outlined our plans in the last manifesto, and now we're radicalising that. And you've seen some of the announcements this week, policy after policy, in which we're enhancing, I think, the, not just the objectives of the last manifesto, but also the detail of it. And the way that we're going to do it is straightforwardly, we're going to take control of our economy. We're going to democratise the economic power that we have in the hands of working people. And it's nothing... It's nothing it's, it, it is nothing complex. It is nothing complex. The way in which we take control of the economy and we determine our own destinations is through public ownership. So when we say we're going to bring rail, we're going to bring water, we're going to bring energy, and we're going to bring Royal Mail back into public ownership, we are, and we're going to manage it ourselves with workers' control. And the reason... We're doing that is because we have a deep belief that working people can manage their own existence and their own economy. And when we say we're going to double the cooperative sector, we're most probably going to triple or quadruple it when we go into government as well. And that's how we take control. And, the, and yesterday, when I brought forward the proposals on, which were not particularly radical, when we simply said when a worker works for a company, it's the worker who creates the wealth. Therefore, the worker, therefore the worker should share in the distribution of that wealth, and it should be done by ownership of that wealth as well. And to be frank, what was amazing last night, I don't know whether you saw it in the YouGov polls, it had something like 60% support, and in Labour supporters, 70% support, support from even Tory voters. And, and when we said last year, and we've developed the policy on, that actually we've, we've had enough. We've had enough of being ripped off. So we're going to end the PFIs. We're going to bring them back in-house, every one of them. What was, what was interesting is the scale of support that we, we got as well. And all of the policies we've advocated now are just really... I think we were at that moment when the hegemony of neoliberalism is breaking down, and what we're putting forward now is accepted as common sense, pragmatic policies that could easily transform the existence of so many within our community itself. And it's just that sense of, I, I, I just explain it in this way, it's, it's just that sense that somehow we've caught the mood of the times, the wind is behind our sails on this. And it is after eight years of, and that's unfortunate it is, but it is after hard, eight years of hard and grinding austerity where people have just said we've had enough. This myth of neoliberalism hasn't worked for us. They've sold us something that never worked anyway and that they want an alternative. And that alternative that people want is radical. It is radical for us. And so when people go to work, they want to ensure that they have a trade union to represent them. They want to ensure that they have a say. They want a real living wage. They want to ensure that, yes, they, once again, we negotiate together in collective bargaining to secure the income that they need to have a decent living. All of these ideas now are actually literally being, I think we've raised the issues, they're now being echoed right the way throughout our communities. So this is the moment. This is the moment of our opportunity that we can seize. And the responsibility that we have, I think, is phenomenal. The responsibility, I keep saying it, four million children in poverty out there, we owe a debt of honour to, to lift them out of that poverty when we go into government. But the, 
I'd... When we when we talk about massive figures like a million not receiving social care anymore, we have to understand what that means. It means out there tonight, there'll be isolated elderly people, may not even been fed today because of the lack of care, who are extremely vulnerable. And again, we're not going to ever allow that to happen ever again under a Labour government, ever, <laughs> ever. And, the, and I, I talk about the 5,000 people sleeping rough, but also, it's all, you know, we now know 100,000 children being brought up in temporary accommodation, never having a permanent roof over their heads. And all that, that means for their relationships, their education, and their futures. All because we haven't built the council houses that we desperately need, and we will do. We will do when we go back into power. All of All of, that, all of that is these are things that we've argued for for years. And often, yes, it has been about shouting through the letterbox almost and peeping through the keyhole, trying to ensure that at least there's uh, some sustenance in terms of the ideas of socialism within our community. And then when, when the neoliberal regime started to collapse, it gave us the opportunity then to win the argument and then also win the battle of position too. And we won the battle of position on the basis of organisation. And I just want to, you know, it was organisation. What was amazing was the scale of organisation that went ahead. And most of you were involved in that, in going out there, securing the support that we had for our ideas, getting Jeremy elected. And this last three years, it has been tough. It has been, you know, two leadership elections, a coup against us, where in that coup, the, sh the shadow cabinet resigning, in, in, not en masse, over that weekend, what they planned was they resigned every four hours, a small block of them. So we thought it would be stabilised, then another group went as well. And we went through that whole period, and the reason we came through it is because we were sustained by a mass movement, and you are that mass movement. It gave us... It... But that weekend was tough, but by the Monday we had to go in with a new shadow cabinet. And if we hadn't gone to that PLP with a new shadow cabinet, I think we were vulnerable, extremely vulnerable. And what was fantastic, what was fantastic, was the opportunity it gave us to bring on the next generation of socialist leaders. And they're here. And they're here. These are the people who will be taking this socialism forward in the future. I don't... I'm immensely proud of... I'm immensely proud of every one of them. Because they stepped up to the plate in the most difficult circumstances, the most challenging position. They received all the abuse and all the rest as well, and yet they stood firm. They stood firm to support this project. And without them, I don't think it would have been sustained. And that's how precarious it was at the time. We've come through that now. We're now in a situation where we're within touching distance of government. So this is the team now that will implement the programme when we go into government itself. And I tell you, this is the team that will take us beyond our first period of office into the second and into the third. I, we will... And people will say it's triumphalism, but actually we understand now, we understand that we can gain, we can gain a victory at the next election on the basis of the mass movement we've built, the ideas that we're promoting, and the organisational ability to deliver, not just the vote, but to actually deliver the hearts and minds of the people of this country to what we're advocating. But beyond that as well, we believe also we can, in that first period of office, we can lay the foundations for the next period of the transformation of our society. And that society will be one, and I keep repeating it time and time again, it will be radically fairer. 
radically more democratic, radically more equal. Yes, based upon a prosperous economy that's environmentally and economically sustainable, but where that prosperity will be shared by everybody, by everybody. And I say time and time again, that's socialism. That's socialism. No longer... I just say this finally, really. In this coming period now, I'm not sure when the general election is going to come. I think it will come sooner rather than later than I thought earlier, earlier this year. But there is a responsibility on all of our shoulders now. We're a movement of half a million Labour Party members. The trade union movement is growing again. There's a responsibility on all of our individual shoulders now. I think we've got to double our membership. I think we've got to get out there and recruit every person we know that we possibly can. I think also everybody now, in every individual, has got to apply their minds, their creativity to the development of our ideas, the development of policy, so that we can then, when we go into government, we'll bring all the creative strength that we have together in terms of the advocacy of those policies and the implementation of those policies. And the third thing as well is recognise, yes, it will be tough. It will be tough when we go into government. And I said yesterday, this isn't to lower expectations. This is to recognise just how radical we have to be. And that does mean when we go into government, we're a movement that sustains that government, continues to campaign and battle for the ideas that we're promoting, helps us in the implementation of those policies itself, and continues to grow as a movement overall. This is a serious project. Ab possibly the most serious all of you will have within your lives itself. You know, a number of years ago, I'd had a heart attack. I was looking for a quiet drift into retirement, <laughs> sitting, sitting at the back of a hall moaning that no one ever listened to me, that's why it's all gone wrong, etc. <laughs> this is such an opportunity now for all of us to change the world. John McDonnell, everyone. <laughs> a lot of what we have heard is how we have to transform our economy, how we have to build that new industrial strategy, and how we fundamentally have to look at that intersection between business and the environment and energy. And the person who is up for this task could be no better. Rebecca Long Bailey. Oh, thanks, everybody. Now, I've got to follow John now, one of our greatest speakers. But I wanted to tell a bit of a story, and I'm sorry if you've heard it before, because I generally have ranted about this before, but I never tire of telling it. And when we started on the last general election campaign in Salford, where, where I'm from, we decided to launch it on the same day as Salford Labour Movement's May Day rally. And what we do every May Day is we march to a place called Bexley Square. And Bexley Square has an important place in our heart. And it's because years and years and years ago, we had a number of people who marched to Bexley Square. And they were protesting against the means testing of unemployment benefits and the cutting of the winter fuel allowance, the coal allowance as it was known then. 
and they were met with horrendous violence, police on horses with batons, uh, who beat the protesters, and it became known as the Battle of Bexley Square. And our Trades Council in Salford managed to get one of those red plaques put in Bexley Square. So we use it as a focal point now every year uh, on May Day. So we thought, yeah, it's great. We'll launch the general election campaign on May Day. It, you know, it was really, really fitting. So I remember I was standing waiting to do my speech, like rallying the troops. And remember, at that time, we'd had all sorts of media reports saying that the Labour Party was going to be absolutely destroyed, that Jeremy Corbyn was on his way out, and that people just didn't have an appetite for socialism. And I got a little bit depressed, and I thought, well, I wonder if it's true, but I've still got this inherent belief that everybody wants the same thing that I'm trying to champion and who you know, the rest of the team are trying to champion. And then I got even more depressed because I thought to myself, you know, this is like a poignant place in Salford. I wonder what the people who were involved in the Battle of Bexley Square would think about where we are now. You know, they were like you in this room. They put their blood, sweat and tears into fighting in a labour movement for a better life. Then there were the people who came after them, risking their livelihoods putting themselves and their families at risk just to stand up for what they believed in, to try and make life better for their children. And people lost everything in some cases, fighting for that political and social justice. And I thought to myself, well, you know, if they could look at where we are now, would, we think, would they think all of that was worth it? Would they think that it was worth putting themselves in that position and putting their lives and families at risk? And I got really depressed because I thought, look at where we are now, especially in Salford. I thought, we've got people walking miles and miles every day to go to zero-hour contract jobs, only to find out that they've got no work and not even been able to afford the bus fare home. You've got people being sanctioned for missing appointments at the job centre or other absurd excuses, having to live sometimes for months without any money coming in at all. You've got people having to undergo the dehumanising work capability assessment only to have all of their points stripped away. You've got a third of children living in poverty, families sleeping in one room against walls that are covered in black mould. And I thought to myself, the people in, that, in our movement who fought for everything, if they could see what was going on now, they would be turning in their graves thinking, my God, I fought for a better world, yet everything I fought for is being regressed and reversed at a horrific pace. So then we went out into the general election and Labour's manifesto was published. And I always say, whoever leaked the manifesto was the greatest PR stunt that the <laughs> Labour Party's ever pulled. Because from a very you know, dark position at the start of the campaign, we suddenly started hearing on the doorstep that people wanted to talk about our policies, not about who was having a row with who and, you know, what the latest gossip was in the Labour Party. They wanted to talk about what socialism meant and they liked it. They liked that we were bringing water back into public ownership. They liked that we were banning zero-hour contracts. They liked that we made sure that every single workplace would have trade unions accessing them to make sure that our workers were protected. They liked our 20-point plan on workers' rights. And I could go on all night talking about the fantastic policies that we had in that manifesto. And then even in Salford, we had people putting posters of Jeremy. You know the Barack Obama poster where it's blue and red? And it says hope. But they put Jeremy's picture on it. And it was in people's living room windows. And I've never seen anything like that before in my entire life. And then we got to the general election, and I was excited by this stage, because I thought, that's it, this is our time, we're going to win and we're going to transform the world. And we didn't win. And I was a little bit despondent until I realised what had actually happened. We'd actually seen the biggest shift in the polls in British electoral history. Yeah.
We managed to secure a new intake of new socialist MPs who were just as excited about socialism as I was, and that was exciting. And they form part of the socialist campaign group now, improving the numbers so that we're now a force to be reckoned with. So it's exciting, but we didn't win the election. But I honestly believe if we'd have had a few more weeks to get our policies out there, we would be in government now. And now I want to think back to my depressive thoughts at the beginning of the general election campaign. I think to myself, and, you know, and I want to convey this message to all of you, that we did see something happen at that election. And it's still happening now because our communities are hungry for change. They're becoming politicised. People who never spoke about politics before are becoming engaged in politics. And it's up to us to make sure we keep that fire in people's bellies. And I want to say thank you, because when I think about the people in Bexley Square and what they did, it's no different to what you're doing. Going out there, speaking to your friends and family, speaking to the dodgy UKIP relative that Angela Vane has talked about before, and trying to convince them that socialism is the way forward. That's what you've done. You've ignited a passion a passion in our communities that isn't going to go out for a long time. And as John has said, if we've got anything to do with it, it will never go out. So you can look yourselves in the mirror tonight when you've, after you've got back, after you've had a few drinks and enjoyed yourself. And you can say, yeah, when it came to it, when I had to stand up to fight for what I believed in, I did it. But this time, we will have that socialist government and that socialist leader. Thanks very much. A socialist government, what a, it would have seemed like such a dream, but now is almost a reality. And one of the reasons of that reality is that we managed to mobilize and inspire young people. But of course we know that the Tories are trying to do everything to repress that vote. We know the Tories are trying to do everything to stop our young people being educated. And that's why, as a youth worker and former chair of the Woodcraft folk, I'm so, I'm so, I am so delighted that we have a shadow for youth and, and voter, um, uh, for, for youth that we have put for the first time a statutory youth service on the agenda. And that person, the person who's done that is Cat Smith. Thank you. I can always, uh, when Eli grows up, tell him that his first standing ovation was here at the Socialist Campaign Group Fringe. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I wasn't um, billed as speaking at this Fringe meeting because actually I wasn't planning on coming to the Labour Party conference this year because two months ago I gave birth to my first child, Eli, who's uh, with me tonight. So. I thought, you know what, I'm just going to sit this one out and I'll watch it on the telly at home and that's what I've been doing. But whilst I've been watching it on the telly at home, I have been so inspired that I, I felt like I had to come down here and be a part of it. So we arrived in Liverpool just a few hours ago. So I want you to know that out there, there will be many more people than there are in this room tonight who will be watching what's happening here in Liverpool. They'll be watching it on television, they'll be following it on social media 
and like me, they'll be so inspired and want to go out there and campaign for a socialist Labour government to actually deliver the change that we need to deliver in this country, because it's broken. The Tories have broken our country, and they have ruined the chances of the next generation. And under Jeremy Corbyn's leadership, he has put youth affairs at the heart of the Shadow Cabinet. We are a Shadow Cabinet where I sit there and can be the voice of youth affairs. Now think about that. Because that is giving the next generation a voice. The next generation who quite frank, well, this one here is one of them, I guess. Uh, a generation that feel really let down by what's happened with austerity. Because they're a generation that have paid a price for a crisis they didn't create. Yes. We've seen 600 youth centres close under this government. We've seen students having their tuition fees trebled. And do you know what? It's really hard on that generation, and it's going to be even harder on future generations unless we get that Labour government where we can make education free. Because it's not a privilege to be able to study, and nobody should be put off educating themselves from an inability to pay or a fear of debt. And that is an important principle. And under Angela Rayner, we're seeing some really radical education policies announced at this conference. But also, we need to rebuild a youth service, and it needs to be a statutory youth service, because not every young person finds the support they need at school. And Jeremy gets this, and I'm so pleased that these youth affairs are so important that I sit there at the heart of the Shadow Cabinet to really try and transform this country. And I know it's hard, and I know that we've really been through it over the past few years, and I thought what Becky was saying just before really hit home for me, because I was there, Yes, the youngest member of the Shadow Cabinet, but also the member of the Shadow Cabinet at the last general election who had the smallest majority. And I had journalists ringing me up and saying, how do you feel still back in Jeremy Corbyn when you're going to lose your seat? Well, that 12th of the majority, it went up somewhat. And it went up somewhat because of people like you. So I'd like to end by saying thank you for keeping the faith, keeping campaigning, and thank you particularly anyone who came to campaign in Lancaster and Fleetwood, or any of the other seats where we managed to take seats off the Tories, because that was phenomenal. So thank you ever so much. Keep doing what you do. I know that the next Labour government will make sure that the next generation has a future that they can look forward to. Thank you ever so much. So, another one of my new intake that I think has been absolutely formidable is here with us tonight. She has got a wafer-thin majority that we are going to triple, treble, we're going to put zeros at the end of at the next election because her constituents are so lucky and we are so lucky to have an MP like Laura Smith. It is an absolute pleasure to be amongst comrades, and what a conference that this has been. It's clear that Labour is a government in waiting and a government with Jeremy Corbyn as our Prime Minister. We will rebuild Britain for the many and not the few. And that doesn't just mean a redistribution of wealth, important as this is, it means a redistribution of power too. We will democratise and empower our communities. We will democratise our workplaces and empower the real wealth creators in our economy, the workers. <laughs> Last year, I was a working class mum, a former primary school teacher, campaigning against cuts to schools. Within weeks of that campaign, we defeated a Conservative Education Minister. And we 
return Crewe and Nantwich to Labour for the first time since 2008. As Lloyd mentioned, my majority is small. It is 48 small people who are so important to me. Please, comrades, come and campaign in Crewe and Nantwich. Now, I started as an ordinary, I don't like the word ordinary working class mum, who was a primary school teacher, and now I am a working class MP. <laughs> comrades, that is what Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party is all about. A socialist party of the people for the people. <laughs> the Tories are on the ropes, comrades. We are closer than ever to delivering a socialist government with socialist policies rebuilding Britain for the many and not the few. <laughs> We owe it to the people of Britain to deliver the radical government that they need and to do that we must strengthen our links with trade unions at a national, a regional and a local level. <laughs> our party was built on the foundations laid by trade unions. Without the unions there would have been no Labour Party and without the unions, there will be no socialist Labour government. As socialists, we must work to strengthen the link between the party and the unions, for our strength comes from our unity and our solidarity. Today we've heard calls for a true people's vote, a general election. Yeah. Comrades, we must topple this cruel and callous Tory government as soon as we can. And if we can't get a general election, we should organise with our brothers and sisters in the trade union to bring an end to this government with a general strike. in the history of our movement and we owe it to the future generation to the working class to seize the opportunity to bring an end to neoliberalism and create a new social economic and political consensus based on fairness humanity and compassion a socialist future <laughs> by the results on open selection. Our party is on a journey. Think how far we've come in the short time since Jeremy was elected. We have made progress this year and I intend to make full use of that progress by encouraging the branches in my, my CLP to trigger an open selection so that members get the democratic choice that they deserve. <laughs> transform our party and our communities so that we can reclaim our country for the workers in unity comrades thank you
I told you she was amazing. <laughs> now, if any of you read his Morning Star article, he talked about how democracy is the most powerful idea. And for many of you, you will have seen him on a democracy roadshow. And that roadshow... That roadshow didn't end at the start of conference. It continues. Chris Williamson. What an amazing meeting, what a fantastic reception, thank you so much. I'm reliably informed this is probably the biggest campaign group fringe meeting in the history of the Labour Party. And comrades, we are on our way. You, we are giving millions of people in our country hope again, and that is so important. And I remember how distressed I felt when I lost my seat in 2015. And I was one of those 15 MPs who'd composed a statement calling on the leadership to do three things. That was to reject austerity, to commit to repealing all of the anti-trade union legislation and to properly renationalising the railways. And I regret to say that Ed and leadership team at the time disregarded us. I'm delighted, however, to say that Jeremy Corbyn, John McDonnell, Diane Abbott, they were among the signatories, the 15 signatories of that letter. And in the, uh, in the run into the 20... 15 general election, John McDonnell was organising a series of what are referred to as people's parliament meetings and we were taking over committee rooms in parliament to invite in members of the public to discuss policy. And I remember Jeremy speaking at a meeting that John had asked me to chair about foreign policy and Jeremy was there speaking and I said to him afterwards, I joked really to him afterwards and said, wouldn't it be wonderful Jeremy if one day you could be the shadow foreign secretary, or maybe when we're in government, the actual foreign secretary. And within six months, he was the best leader this party's had since Keir Hardy. And there, and there were people that were saying to me, people on the left, people of good heart, when the general election was called in 2017, and I was privileged to be selected again to fight Derby North, they said to me, look, Chris, we need you back in there, so distance yourself from Jeremy. <laughs> because they said, the most important thing is, is winning, and you know, it's going to be difficult for us. And they were saying it you know, with the best of motives, and there's absolutely no way I'm going to do that. Not only is it the wrong and dishonourable thing to do? But I also think you're wrong-headed because think how the policy agenda that Jeremy is espousing is electorally popular. And so far from denying my support for Jeremy Corbyn, we issued a press release saying I was the most Corbyn-friendly candidate in that election. And what happened, comrades? What happened? We fought an unashamedly pro-Jeremy Corbyn, pro-common-sense socialist programme and we won with a thumping majority and we will double that majority, if not triple it, next time around in Derby North. But you know, there's never been an easier time to campaign for the Labour Party. The overwhelming majority of the British people agree with our policies. Yes, we're bumping along at around 40-odd percent in the opinion polls, 
But when you look at our policy agenda, whether it be bringing the railways back into public ownership, the utilities, scrapping tuition fees, bringing the water industry back into public ownership, a staggering 83% want the water brought back into public ownership, and we will do it. And it won't just be the kind of top-down statist approach that we introduced when we came into government in 1945. It would be very much a bottom-up approach. A public ownership agenda where the people will feel genuinely part of it, a genuine sense of ownership. Because the prize, comrades, <clears throat> the prize is to transform our country. Not just once, but forever. That is what we are fighting for. A change in the balance of power in this country, an irreversible change in the balance of power of this country. And it is achievable with your support. And so as I've said as I go around the country, this isn't just about winning the next election. This is about changing the course of history. And you, comrades, you in this room, and the hundreds of thousands of others out there, and the million that we will reach, I'm sure, as John McDonnell was saying, will help us to bring about that change in the balance of power. And so you're not simply grassroots members of the Labour Party. You, comrades, are history makers. And I want to just conclude, if I may, with the last verse of the Mask of Annie, because it's so apposite to our struggle. Because there are going to be huge forces ranged against us. There already are. And you may have seen the very British coup all those years ago. And when Tony Benn was standing for the deputy leadership, he said, I know why they call us names. It's because they dare not face our arguments. And he's absolutely right. And to all the naysayers, and to all the naysayers who said that Jeremy Corbyn was incapable of winning an election, well, we got the biggest increase in vote share since 1945. And were it, as we've said, that election to have gone on a little bit longer, and were it not for some of the malcontents, it's got to be said inside the PLP, we would have won that election. So our mass movement will not just carry Jeremy across the threshold of number 10. Our mass movement, you, will help to sustain us in power when we get there. And what we've done, comrades, what we've done since Jeremy became the leader of our party is to join in with me, rise like lions after slumber, in unvanquishable number, shake your chains to earth like dew, which in sleep has fallen on you. Ye, we are many, they are few. Forward to victory and socialism, comrades! Changing Britain might be our mission, but changing the world must be our outcome. And the only way we are able to do that is by inspiring and working with others around the world to bring about socialism. And I can tell you, Jeremy has inspired the world. Social democracy was dead on its feet in Europe and in the US we all know what's happened. I remember being in the US working at the time of the first leadership election and I booked, I would say the next flight back but I had to give some notice to my employer, I booked a flight back 
and worked through the summer to make sure Jeremy won the first time round. But I wasn't the only one in the US to be inspired. And I want to now introduce to you someone who's not an MP, but someone who I hope will play an important role in the US and here in the UK. Bashkara Sankara, I've got that right? Probably not, but he'll <laughs> correct it. Is the founder of Jacobin and, and has relaunched our magazine back in the place, the political place, that it deserves to be. And I want to introduce to him so he can talk to you about what Jeremy is doing to inspire those around the world. Well, I'm honored by the, by the reception, especially because I know how much damage young Americans in ill-fitted suits did in the 1990s when they came to Labor Party conferences. We exported the New Democrats. We helped lead an international, a third way international, that inflicted countless harms against our class, against the cause of democracy and peace and justice. So I'm surprised but honored that you would invite one of us back. When I became a socialist, I was I was 14 years old, so probably way too young to be making these kind of lifelong decisions. But I was brought into a very small organization, the Democratic Social Support of America. We had maybe five, 6,000 members across the entire country. I was really excited, I was 18 years old, I went to my first meeting, there was four people there. <laughs> the other three were in their 60s and 70s. <laughs> and they've been my lifelong mentors ever since, they wouldn't leave me alone. They want to really make sure I came back. It's for that generation, those people who kept the hope and the flame alive, that we owe this revival, both in the United States and in the UK. They told us that our convictions, that our ideas were dead, but our convictions are that we want to live in a world without exploitation. We want to live in a world where life outcomes are the result of accidents of birth. We want to live in a world without hierarchy. And we still live in a world with all those things. That's why we're building a socialist movement, not just here, but in the United States. Bernie Sanders is a survivor from that old generation. He had an even harder task, because there's just a socialist group of one in the United States Senate. When we walk into Bernie Sanders' office, you'll see a picture of Eugene Debs, the great American socialist leader 100 years ago. When he went on the campaign trail and people tried to red bait him, he said, I'm a democratic socialist because I believe in justice and humanity. And guess what? We won areas that they told us were moderate. We won areas that went for Trump. Why? Because our language and our message is too simple to be ignored. It's that everyone deserves a fair shot at life and that we can excel and help each other excel and life should not be a zero-sum game where some suffer and some live in wealth and abundance. The Democratic Socialists of America that I joined 11 years ago with 5,000 members now has 52,000 members. <laughs> Bernie Sanders is the most popular politician in the United States. The world is no longer afraid of socialism. The world is yearning for something different for something democratic, for something radical. And I hope that we can win the battle, both within our parties and within our communities, to bring forth a new generation of socialism to finally have socialism in our time. Well done. Well done. Well done. Well done.
Socialism in our time, comrades. <laughs> Don't have to count, but yeah, thank you. Um, the next person I want to invite you to listen to um, is another one of these new bright stars of socialism who is doing such an important job with the aftermath, of course, of Grenfell, with the continued attacks against some of our firefighters. I know as an MP that was sponsored by the FBU and I still work out of the FBU offices for my constituency office, how much they appreciate the work that Karen Lee is doing. Lloyd. I'm Karen Lee and I joined the Labour Party almost 25 years ago. I think like a few of the others on here, I wanted to change the world. However, I remained a member during the new Labour years. <laughs> but I'm proud now that we've got a socialist leading our party because now we will change the world. I stood in Lincoln, and in Lincoln it's a bellwether seat, and Lincoln always goes the same way as the country goes in terms of the government, but this time it didn't. <laughs> this time it didn't. John came to my constituency, Jeremy came, and you know what, despite a really, and I know none of them are very nice, but a really truly appalling right-wing, horrible, misogynistic Tory, we won. We won Lincoln for Labour. <laughs> stood on this, which is the most progressive manifesto since 1945. And I am just so proud after all of those years to have been elected in 2017 to a Labour Party led by Jeremy Corbyn. I think I might have mentioned it once or twice, but uh, I'm a proud public servant. I was a nurse for almost 15 years, and I've seen... <laughs> I've been on those hospital wards, I've seen those cuts firsthand. I've seen when you haven't actually got enough nurses to do the job properly or safely, and when people have to wait for things that they shouldn't have to wait for. There is, and I would say, one of the things that I believe in most strongly is there is absolutely no space for private companies in a properly funded NHS. Thank you, comrades. So when I speak from the green benches about our NHS, and sometimes I, get, I lose my cool a little bit and I get back to the office and I say to my office staff, God, I blew my top there, and they go, no, no, you were great, and I think, oh. But you know what, it's because it comes from personal experience, and I've got a real passion to see an NHS which works for its patients. And that is what I want to see for this country's fire service. As Labour's Shadow Fire Minister, I can tell you now that when we go into government, when and not if, when we go into government, we will ensure that this country is a fully funded fire service. We'll recruit more firefighters and we'll implement national standards. We'll have a proper regulatory framework and we will scrap the pay cap on firefighters' wages. <laughs> Labour government will put public safety before private profit, private profit and the kind of tragedy that was Grenfell Tower must never ever be allowed to happen again. A 
And comrades, for me, one of the burning injustices, we must make sure that those people left homeless by that tragedy have permanent homes and they're properly taken care of. Their treatment so far has been a national disgrace. Lessons must be learnt and we must have a robust regulatory framework that doesn't allow dangerous cladding to put the public safety at risk. We must ensure that the attempts by the Tories too to blame the Grenfell Tower fire at the door of our brave firefighters who have only ever done a brilliant job risking their lives supporting... They risked their lives and they continue supporting the bereaved and survivors. They line they the, the London Fire Brigade, you know, they line under, under one of the bridges at the monthly silent march. They're there every month, even now, 16 months on. But we must not allow them to be scapegoated. I went to that inquiry one day and they're doing their best, but we will not allow those firefighters to be scapegoated. <laughs> Comrades, we must stand united. Sometimes it can be a little bit difficult in Westminster, and as Ian Lavery often reminds me, they never said the struggle would be easy. <laughs> we must take our fight to the doorstep, and we must start now. The next general election is imminent, and comrades, a Labour government is but a whisper away. Let's get out and fight for it. <laughs> Brilliant, well done. <laughs> Many firefighters in Catalonia when they were repossessing houses um, and they were asking the firefighters to do the work had a slogan that said, we save people and not banks. <laughs> and saving people is often what the day-to-day -day of the Department for Work and Pensions is about. People who often are the most vulnerable, often have the very least to live on. And what has this government done? it has introduced some of the most cruel and nasty reforms to benefits and welfare that we have seen in a generation. And at the moment of the party need, Margaret stood up and she has taken on this fantastic role, this important role, to fight for some of the most vulnerable. Margaret Greenwood. Thank you. Thank you, comrades. It is absolutely fantastic to be here at Labour Party conference in Liverpool. And I think it has been a really tremendous atmosphere so far, and we've still plenty more to go. Over the last few days, I have been privileged to hear fantastic speeches, have tremendous conversations with people. And what really strikes me about it is one thing, and that is our shared passion to secure a Labour government led by Jeremy Corbyn. We know, we know how to do it. We speak to the electorate, we use social media, we do everything we can to get our message out there. One thing I want to tell you about the fantastic general election campaign we had last year, and massive thank you to everybody, and there's lots of people in the room who came to help me and Wirral West. But huge, yeah, they were brilliant. It was a brilliant, brilliant campaign. One of the things that some months after that campaign, because there's quite a lot of Tories in, in Wirral West, I was at um, uh, a garden party type thing in a park, and uh, there was a, an elderly lady came up to me and she said, oh, you know, uh, yeah, we had the Labour campaign. And she said, I looked out my window and there were four young people, arm in arm, smiling away, all with Jeremy T-shirts on. And she said, so it must be true, mustn't it? He does give them hope. 
And I thought, how brilliant is that? We communicate our message in so many ways, in our t-shirts, in our demeanor, in our language, in how we communicate with people. It is massively important that we remember that. And of course we're united because we have all absolutely had enough of the Tory austerity agenda which we know is a political choice. There is nothing inevitable about it. And all the sorts of things we're campaigning for are things that, you know, most people think of as just normal things about living in this country. A library that might be open, a swimming pool you might be able to use, a youth centre, a children's centre. All of these things that they're closing down, that they're trying to wipe out of our collective memory as ever having existed. This removal of the public realm has to stop and we have to get a Labour government to reverse that trend. But more than that, the privatisation of the National Health Service is something that is going on under our noses. And I want to pay tribute to all of those health campaigners in this room and across the country who are doing such a fantastic job. You are, you are going to meet... You are challenging your CCGs, you're scrutinising absolutely every last thing that happens and I know how hard that work is and the brilliant work you're doing. I just want to say keep up that fight because we need you to do that. We need that army of people out there saying, sorry, you're not having it. The NHS is ours, it's not for sale. And it's, been, it's my immense honour to have been asked to take on the role for the DWP team, to lead that team. And I have to say, the work, what's going on under the Tories to, to Social Security in our country is uh, frightening, I think I would say. They have created this toxic environment in which disabled people have been treated appallingly. Numerous suicides associated with, their, with, with the policies that, that, that they are um, using. And the whole sanctions regime within the Social Security system is destroying lives, it's making people's lives misery and it's taking hope from them and, it's, and it has to be reversed and we have to change the way in which people talk about social security. No more of the shirker driver narrative which George Osborne and uh, the other one whose name keeps escaping me and I think it's because he did something terrible and then left the stage. But um, no more of their narrative around this. We need a social security system that any of us can rely on at any point in our time. We've got a big job to do to turn the, turn the narrative around because there are so many programs on TV, so much narrative in the tabloids to try and undermine people's sense of entitlement to support from their fellow human beings uh, in their time of need. We need to challenge that. I think one of the ways we do it is we say it's actually a normal thing to need help. There's no shame in needing help. We all need help at some time in our lives. And the other thing, the other thing that we have to do is this. We have to insist that there is dignity and respect at the heart of the social security system for those who need it and for those who work in the system to deliver it. No more can this continue. The cruelty has got to stop. We have to have a complete change in direction. And, uh, you know, we've announced a massive consultation we're going to be doing on the forms that our social security system should take. And I would encourage everybody to get involved in that so that we can make sure that we have a service that is there for any of us and that we feel proud of, that we feel proud to support and that we know will be there to support us in return when we need it. So I just want to say thank absolutely everybody for all of the campaigning that you're doing and all the campaigning that you do on the ground in wherever you are and just keep up that fantastic fight. Together we know that we can do it, we know we can get a Labour government and we know we can get Jeremy Corbyn into number 10. Thank you. Justice and the right, of course, to be helped is not just something that we have to look at home. We, of course, have to make sure that we look at that abroad as well. And I know 
as someone who's worked in international development, what a leading role that, Bru that the Labour Party has played historically in this. Not just those solidarity activities that trade unionists and Labour Party members do day in, day out, whether it be for Colombia or whether it be historically for South Africa or, of course, for Palestine, that we have won a great... that we have won a great victory on. But the reality is the Conservatives are trying to undermine our international development efforts. They are trying to securitise it and they are trying to underfund it. And on the front line, fighting that, is another one of our fantastic 2017 intake, Dan Carden. Thank you, everyone. Can I start by saying welcome to the Socialist Republic of Liverpool. The people of Liverpool Walton voted 85.7% of the vote for Labour under Jeremy Corbyn. And they're waiting for the rest of the country to catch up. Friends, my dad was a Liverpool docker, my granddad was a Liverpool docker. Four, five generations of my family worked on Liverpool's docks. Trade unions turned what was casual labour into good jobs. Any job, any job can be a good job if we organise and we fight for our rights. And in 1995, when my dad went into dispute alongside 500 Liverpool dockers, that dispute lasted 27 months. It left him unemployed for seven years. And I grew up in a family where the trade union wasn't just about organised labour and winning rights. It was where I got my Christmas presents. It's where we had a community and a family. And that is what the labour movement is all about. And it was a fight against casualisation, the very thing that scars our economy and our society today. What was affecting my family and only a few families or a few thousand families 20 years ago is now ravaging communities across the country and more and more people. It is the norm, not the exception. And so it is no surprise that people are looking for a radical solution, a radical government to transform our economy and to rebuild Britain. And isn't it quite amazing that back in 2010, we were an austerity light party. Back in 2012, we had a shadow chancellor who backed public sector pay restraint. And in 2015, we had MPs told to walk through the lobby to vote for a Tory welfare bill that would cut the welfare for the poorest in society. No more! And friends, it's no surprise people want a radical Labour government when every achievement of this movement, which has lasted well over a hundred years, is coming under attack. Our NHS being privatised, attacks on workers' rights and trade unions, and attacks on our social security system. That is why the radical solution is needed, because the attacks have been so fierce and so detrimental to our society, and that is why people are saying they have had enough, and they want the hope that Jeremy Corbyn represents. <laughs> And so, friends, when I meet people in my constituency, 
which is North Liverpool, which is a deprived community. And Liverpool is now the second most destitute city in the UK and has, my constituency has 40% of children growing up in poverty. It is shameful. When I meet people who are being moved on to universal credit and onto the Tory welfare system, my heart breaks when I hear the stories that they can't use the computer system. My heart breaks when I hear they have to wait 12, 14, 16 weeks for their first payment, and when the response they get is go to the food bank. But what I cannot understand is how we have a welfare system that thinks it's productive to send people, women sometimes in their 60s who've worked in factory jobs, who've worked as cleaners all of their lives, they're told to go out with their CVs, handing them in to shops, to home and bargains, to restaurants where they know they won't get a job. What on earth is productive about that in a civilised society? Friends, I want to finish on this and a message of hope because we are going to be told that a general election isn't likely, isn't going to happen. Welcome, Diane. We're going to be told. I'm so glad Diane Abbott has had that welcome. I honestly am, because she is the most attacked Labour politician. It is never recognised in the media. And she is a fantastic politician who will be a wonderful Home Secretary. Friends, I'm going to finish on this. I've already heard the excuses being made that we're not going to get a general election because there aren't enough MPs in Parliament to vote for it. What utter nonsense. You cannot have a government divided on one of the most important issues facing this country navel-gazing, arguing with itself, uninterested in the consequences for our country, and they be let off the hook and there be no general election. We will demand that general election, so will the public, and Jeremy Corbyn will lead us into number 10 before next year's conference. Thank you, friends. Thank you very much, Dan. That was rousing, to say the least. And in, and I think, what a better message to send when we are in Liverpool here, your home city. My adopted home city is next to Richard's home city. <laughs> I, yeah, the, the segue. I mean, I've. I've I have been trying hard with the segues, and they, uh, they um, <laughs> um, and actually, we have a connection there. When I started working, we realised that we were both part of the same social centre um, that was in Bradford, the old claimants union there, the one in 12. And that was based, it was set up originally, um, because... Margaret Thatcher had accused one in 12 claimants of fraudulently b claiming. So the claimants organised and they said, fuck you, we're the one in 12 and we're going to organise. <laughs> Organisation is important, but without a recourse to justice, of course, it means nothing once we've secured our rights. I'm privileged to work alongside Richard as his parliamentary private secretary, Richard Bergen. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thanks. Thanks.
Thank you very much, Lloyd. And what a seamless introduction <laughs> that was. You can see why he's such a fantastic MP as he is. And it's, uh, he's, he's a compare beyond compare, as we've seen. He's a comrade beyond compare. OK. I've been told they're called centrist dad jokes. And the thing that's funny about them is they're not funny. But anyway, it's great to be here at what may indeed be the biggest fringe meeting of the socialist campaign group of Labour MPs in its 40-year history. And as we've heard, the Socialist Campaign Group of Labour MPs was set up by Tony Benn to advance the politics in the Labour Party that's not just about managing capitalism, but about changing society. And that's why it's so great that at tonight's rally, we've had speeches from John McDonnell, a long-standing member of the Socialist Campaign Group of Labour MPs. We're going to have a speech from Diane Abbott, a long-standing member of the Socialist Campaign Group of Labour MPs. And of course, it was from the Socialist Campaign Group of Labour MPs that that trend emerged, that red thread was sustained, and that idea emerged of, why don't we put Jeremy Corbyn up to be a candidate to be leader of the Labour Party? <laughs> And when I think about the endurance showed by members in Parliament of that group and their supporters outside Parliament, nobody embodies that spirit of socialism and class politics more than our friend and comrade Dennis Skinner. Whenever we feel down, we have a word with Dennis, and he reminds us, he says, what are you getting stressed out about? He goes, all it is is talking. It's not like a proper job. It's not, it's not like you're working in a factory or down the pit. You've just got to speak, don't worry. It's a good job he hasn't seen me do that impression of him, or he'd probably say something rather angry to me. Unfortunately, Dennis can't be with us tonight. He wanted to be with us. He's feeling a bit under the weather this evening. But you'll be pleased to know he is well and he's looking forward to his next speech, his next awkward question to tedious Teresa and the rest of them. So he'll be back with you soon. And he sends his best wishes to this meeting tonight. He's a key member of the Socialist Campaign Group of Labour MPs. So what brings us together this evening? It's not canapes, croissants, a sponsored buffet or anything like that. What brings us together is a simple thing, socialism. That's what brings us together. We're all proud to be socialists, aren't we? We're all proud to have stuck with Jeremy Corbyn through thick and thin, aren't we? We're all proud, all of us, to be going into number 10 with Jeremy Corbyn and millions of others, aren't we? And isn't it great? to come together and draw that strength from each other. Because as we've heard from earlier, it is actually called a struggle for a reason. And I have to say that all of you have been at the vanguard of this struggle. And one evening, more than many other, makes me think of that. I remember the worst meeting I've ever attended in my life. It's not one of my CLP meetings, honest. <laughs> I can see my delegates from East Leeds CLP down there. The, the, our meetings are always great, even when I speak, they're always really interesting. The worst meeting I've ever attended in my life was a meeting of the Parliamentary Labour Party on the night they tried to get rid of Jeremy Corbyn. 
It was collective bullying, or rather an attempt at collective bullying. I know that we're not meant to say what goes on in the Parliamentary Labour Party, unless you're leaking it to a right-wing newspaper. <laughs> so, do you want to know what goes on? Yeah. Then I'll tell you. <laughs> I remember people shouting, people snarling, people screaming at a decent, modest man trying to do the best for our society. And I also remember somebody who's not classed as a radical leftist just putting his hand up and saying, can't we just have a bit of decency and just calm down and be polite? And he was actually howled down himself and told to shut up. I'll never forget that. I'll never forget. I turned to Ian Labour, he was sat next to me, and he goes, I'm not doing an impression of him. He says, no, no. No, and it won't work, sorry. And the consequences of doing an impression of Ian Lavery are probably even worse than doing an impression of Dennis Skinner. He turned to me and he said, I think we're in a bit of trouble here. Or we've got a bit of trouble here. That's sort of like an impression. Anyway, our spirits were soon lifted because we left that Parliamentary Labour Party meeting. And where did we go? We went out into Parliament Square and we saw about 10,000 Labour members outside. them united by that same message and it's a message actually that makes me think of once Tony Benn the founder of the Socialist Campaign Group of Labour MPs I was lucky enough to get a, a Christmas card from him as a Labour activist he did that to many Labour activists who came across at meetings and the rest of the things he would find out the address send them a card to encourage them and the rest of it and I remember the message on one Christmas card from Tony Benn, which I got as a teenager that I've still got in a folder today. Do you know what it said? Three simple words, keep on going. And that was the message that those 10,000 people outside Parliament were giving to Jeremy and the rest of them. There is a fallacy going about. The fallacy is that it's MPs that inspire members. It's not. It's the members that inspire the MPs. So I want to from the bottom of my heart, say thank you for everything you've done. I despise it when you're demonised. I want to say thank you. You're the kind of honest, decent people who are going to change this society and create that kind of fundamental and irreversible shift in wealth, power and control in favour of working people and the families that John McDonnell talked about in his speech earlier. Let's be honest, as socialists we know that the fundamental division in society isn't between the so-called 48% and the so-called 52%. We're not here just to represent the interests of the 48%. We're not here just to represent the interests of the 52%. As socialists we're here to represent the interests of the 99%. And I know, and I know some of these fancy commentators and establishment figures might not understand that, but the reality is that both people who voted remain and people who voted leave share the same problems. The problems of a lack of council housing, the problems of low wages, the problems of insecure employment, the problems of racism, the problem of being held back from achieving their full potential by debt, the lack of decent jobs and the rest of it. And the Labour Party exists to represent 
all of those people. And at fringe meetings at this conference, I've been talking a bit about the founder of our Labour Party, Keir Hardy, who was a miner, he started work at the age of eight, working in a coal mine, a miner, a socialist, a trade unionist, an internationalist, and he was the founder of our party, from whom I think we can learn a lot about what our party was meant to be and is now about. Keir Hardy, on the eve of the First World War, spoke in Trafalgar Square and was denounced in the press for speaking out against what he said would be the imperialist slaughter of the First World War. They said that Keir Hardy was the public speaker who had more public meetings broken up than any other. He was a person that when he died, unlike most MPs when they die in office then and now, didn't get a tribute in the House of Commons. The House of Commons was silent upon the death of Keir Hardy. But that doesn't really matter at all. He wouldn't have cared. The best tribute that we can pay to Keir Hardy is not to regret that a bunch of hypocrites in the last century didn't pay him tribute in the Palace of Varieties, as Dennis calls it. The best tribute that we can pay to Keir Hardy is to ensure that we build and sustain a government worthy of his political tradition. Keir Hardy was ahead of his time in supporting women in struggle. Keir Hardy was ahead of his time in speaking out against war. Keir Hardy was ahead of his time in speaking out in favour of environmental protection. Keir Hardy actually went to South Africa, argued that black citizens in South Africa, not that they were recognised as citizens, should be allowed to join a trade union, and he was physically assaulted as a result. Does it sound familiar? Yeah. I'll tell you this. Labour is coming home with Jeremy as leader, with Diane as shadow home secretary and John McDonnell as shadow chancellor. And that's thanks to all of you. So when we're talking about the working class, we're talking about the working class in all its diversity because the working class is the majority in society that, as Becky said, creates the wealth, keeps our public services going, civilises our society. And the working class in all its diversity has to be understood as a concept because socialists are all about empowering the working class, putting the working class in the driving seat as a collective politically and economically. Being working class isn't about whether you speak with a Leeds accent or a Derby accent or a Hackney accent or a Liverpoolian accent or anything else. Being working class is about being in that majority in society that keeps the wheels of society turning. And I think when we think about the modern working class in this country, just think of that image of the woman driving the bus, wearing a hijab as is her right and her choice, being assailed, a member of Unite the Union by the way, being assailed by angry faces. That's the modern working class in Britain in 2018. And before I draw my remarks to a conclusion, because by the way, if we don't unite the working class in all its diversity, we ain't going to beat the far right. We ain't going to beat the forces of the establishment. We're not going to be a modern socialist project. Before I draw my remarks to a close, I do want to briefly mention the shadow justice brief. A couple of things that I want to talk about. Firstly, is legal aid. I believe that legal aid should be returned to being a pillar of our welfare state. Not a poor relation of the rest of our welfare state. I believe we should use law centres and let's have more of them. Law centres should be used by a Jeremy Corbyn-led government as engines of empowerment in working class communities. What does that mean? It means 
We are going to use the Ministry of Justice to empower those working class communities in all the diversity. We're going to use the Ministry of Justice to empower, empower the single parent to fight back against her lousy landlord. We're going to use the Ministry of Justice to empower the migrants to fight back against the rotten decisions of the Home Office. We're going to use we're going to use the Ministry of Justice to empower the bullied worker to take on their dreadful boss. And we're going to use the Ministry of Justice to empower the person living with a disability to fight back against those inhumane decisions of the DWP. The Labour Party is nothing if it is not about empowering politically, economically, culturally, the working class majority in all its diversity. And I'll tell you something else we're going to do together when we're in government. We're going to, I know this might upset a few people, so it must be good. We're going to end the Americanization of our justice system. What does that mean? It means no more private prisons. No new private prisons and the current private prisons brought into public ownership. Because I believe as Diane believes, as Jeremy believes, that the incarceration of human beings for profits is simply immoral and under a Labour government it will stop. We're also going to take probation back into public ownership so it can put turning lives round and protecting our communities first, not lining the pockets of the shareholders. Now, of course, that upsets some people who are rather powerful. It might even upset some commentators in the media who think they're rather enlightened. But tough, because it's the right thing to do, and we are going to do it together. We're going to end the situation where the G4Ss and the Carillions of this world pick on the carcass of the Ministry of Justice like vultures. Recently, I heard that G4S have de-recognised the PCS trade union. Well, I've got some news for G4S. A Labour government is going to de-recognise G4S. Things have been tough, but things are going to become tougher. You don't just wind up with a socialist in number 10 committed to that fundamental and irreversible shift in wealth, power and control in favour of the 99% without a fight. You don't end up with a Prime Minister of a powerful nation like the UK with a track record of opposing the, inter the, well, the invasion of Iraq that killed a million people, the so-called intervention in Libya, Afghanistan and elsewhere, you don't end up with a person like that at the top being a key player in international politics without a fight for the establishment. So things are going to get tougher. But Jeremy talks about that, doesn't he? He said he doesn't feel that pressure. The real pressure is felt by those who are the victims of these awful cruel policies of the establishment at home and internationally. And I think, I think really, of one of the things that got me interested in politics in the first place. My auntie was a women against pit closures activist. I grew up 
I couldn't remember, I mean, I was only born in 1980, so I heard about it growing up, but apparently there's a video in my dad's house of me looking, whatever, on his shoulders on the picket line. But hearing about that strike growing up, hearing about what the ruling establishment, the political and economic class that ran the show was prepared to do working class to do to working class people who got together to demand a better society got me thinking about the way society works, the way power works, and why we need a socialist change. So when things feel a bit tough, I think at least I haven't had to go on strike for a year, go to a soup kitchen, be battered by the police and the rest of it. So those who have come before us inspire us, and they all have something in common. They were all told there's no point. They were all told, why do you bother? Well, I tell you why we all bother. We all bother because we care about other people. We all bother because we care about our neighbours. We all bother because we care about people we've never even met, whether they live next door to us, or live down the road, or live in another country. When we get into government, when Jeremy is Prime Minister, when Diane is Home Secretary, when John McDonnell is Chancellor, that won't be the victory just of Jeremy. It won't be just the victory of members of the Shadow Cabinet. It won't be even the victory of those of us who are lucky enough to be Labour MPs. It will be the victory of over half a million Labour members and growing. It will be the victory of millions of Labour voters and growing. It will be the victory of our trade unions. It will be the victory of groups like Momentum. It will be the victory of all of you. Thank you very much. That was, I'm speechless. Amazing, amazing. Now, before we go on to our final speaker tonight, I have a message that someone has texted me that I thought I would read out to you. I have a message from someone who just texted me that I thought I would read out to you. It says, it's been a great conference, a great mood, real solidarity. Thank you for everything, Jeremy. Solidarity is one of those key things that binds us together. And the other thing that we've just heard of with Richard is that fight that we are going to have to continue until we get into and beyond government with the media particularly upping their attack time and time again. And I remember the first time that I went on the Today programme and they cut you off before you can say quite what you want to say. They twist your words, they manipulate it, and you come away feeling like you've let the side down. 
And I remember Diane coming up to me in the tea room afterwards. And saying, just keep on. Keep on with it. They will keep attacking you. But don't worry. You can get through it. And I can tell you something. What I, what we other you know, backbench MPs, the abuse that we get, the media nastiness, it is nothing. It is nothing compared to what Diane Abbott has received. And a weaker person would have buckled. A weaker person would have said, it's not worth it. But she has continued on. And not only continued on, continued to bring fantastic policies forward, policies that will seek justice for our communities that we heard today, policies that will mean that our immigration system is no longer the racist basis that we have. So on that note, you don't want to hear from me. You want to hear from Diane Abbott, our next Home Secretary. Thank you very much, comrades. It's very hard to follow Richard when he's on fire like that. <laughs> but I will do my best. Um, and I have just a few things to say. The first thing to say is that I have been a member of the Socialist Campaign Group since I first became an MP. And that's over 31 years. But this must be one of the biggest rallies that we've ever had. And the renaissance of the Socialist Campaign Group gives me pleasure, but is also vital for the forward progress of the left in this country. You will remember when Jeremy emerged as the left's candidate in 2015. Um, but you won't know how it happened. One of the distinctive things about the Socialist Campaign Group compared to other groupings of MPs is we've always had very close relationships with activists like yourself, social movements and campaigners. And in fact, I believe the long-standing relationship that Jeremy and those of us around him had with activists, campaigners and social movements helped to push his leadership campaign to victory. Anyway, Ed Miliband had stepped down and there was going to be a leadership contest. Now, to be honest with you, to be candid, nobody in the Socialist Campaign Group was particularly thinking of running. We knew we'd be up against the, the huge new Labour machine. You know, we knew or thought we knew we'd get smashed. And there wasn't total enthusiasm. But the energy and the push that said we had to run a candidate, we had to fly a flag for the left, came from activists, came from people like you. And I remember a meeting, a campaign group meeting in, in a room in Parliament called W1. And we were around a table, not much bigger than this platform. And we discussed the fact there was a lot of pressure on the grassroots to run a candidate. Um, so we went around the table, right? 
And I think they got to me, and I said, I'm not running. I did it the last time. <laughs> um, and someone else said, no. John McDonnell said, no. And then finally, we were three quarters of the way around the table, and we got to Jeremy. And we all gave him a hard stare. <laughs> and he said, oh, all right then. <laughs> I think makes him such a great leader of the Labour Party. He's not doing it for personal ambition. He's doing it to respond to what the party in the country wants. He's doing it as the servant of the rank and file. And when they had their terrible coup, where over 100 Labour MPs, led by Margaret Hodge, I'm not saying anything, it was led by Margaret Hodge, <laughs> over 100 Labour MPs signed a letter saying they had no confidence in him as leader, and almost all of his shadow cabinet resigned, people to whom Jeremy had been nothing but nice and kind and friendly. They got together and they resigned on him. And truly, that was a shattering moment for him because Jeremy always liked to think the best of people. And the fact that these people had come together to treat him in such a contemptuous way and to humiliate him and force him out of the leadership was a big blow. And I remember walking over to his office to talk to him. Um, and of course I was saying, you can't, you can't let them win. You've got to. And he said to me, you know, there is so much support out there. I owe it to them. I owe it to the people that voted. is a very nice man, nicer than me, I think, um, because he's got a very sunny temperament, I think people don't understand how much the past two years has taken out of him. Um, they don't understand how painful it was to have people he thought were friends, some of them, people he'd worked on on issues before he became leader, turn on him in the way he did. And, you know, there are many days and weeks where Jeremy has journalists and cameramen outside his house. And it's happened to me, but with Jeremy, it's, it's constant. And it's hard on him, but it's also hard on his partner, Lara, and his children. And yet, Jeremy has powered through. And he has powered through because he believes in you. He believes in his supporters. He believes... to him, not something he sought, but it falls to him that to, to form part of a movement that will make life better for so many ordinary people and other people who don't have a voice at all. So when you look at the situation we find ourselves in, the astonishing thing to me is that even in opposition, even under relentless attacks by the media and other Labour MPs, Jeremy has helped to change the political debate. Do you think Theresa May would have been talking about council houses last week if it wasn't for the campaigning that we have all done? amongst Labour MPs and the Labour right, says a dicky bird against the policies of nationalisation. 
Who says a dicky bird about the idea of bringing the NHS wholly back into public ownership? Who says a dicky bird about nationalising the railways? They say nothing because they know those, populars, those policies are popular and are what the British people need. So they have to resort to bitter personal attack. But he has changed the parameters of the debate. He has moved the party beyond New Labour. And I spoke to a New Labour minister, a past New Labour minister that I know, who's not a supporter of Jeremy at all, but he said to me, you know what? And this is a New Labour person. He said, you know what? Jeremy represented a necessary course correction. So even his enemies understand that what Jeremy represents had to happen. So they, they can't argue with the policies, maybe a detail here or there. Maybe there's some of them that don't really want to talk about rent control. Hey, but, but, I'm not naming no names, I'm not. You know what I mean? But he has moved the politics on, and even people that I know personally are not supposed to Jeremy have to pass themselves off as Corbynistas. <laughs> but I'm not saying anything else, not at all, not at all. So he's transformed the politics and affected not just our party, but other parties. You have to, what, last week? You, I saw, heard, read Lib Dems wringing their hands about Tory immigration policy. Lib Dems who are in coalition and voted for those policies. <laughs> but even they want to distance themselves. The other thing which is distinct about the Corbyn project is that the Politics of labour, fighting austerity, right to working people go alongside a visionary approach to foreign policy. <laughs> now, there are some people that will say, yes, fighting austerity is good, uh, but talking about the rights of the Palestinians, mm, maybe not so much. But for Jeremy, it's all part and parcel of a fight for justice. So Jeremy has shown, I think, considerable personal courage, which often doesn't get acknowledged, in taking the pressures both on him and his family that he's taken till now. Jeremy has changed the political debate in this country. Jeremy has shown that a left domestic analysis goes with a left international uh, analysis. <laughs> Occasionally people used to say to me, well, what, what does really Jeremy believe in? What he actually believes in is really very simple. Peace abroad and social justice at home. Yeah, yeah. And I, And actually we find that a very large proportion of the British public believe in these things. Even some Tories. Even some Tories. Um, so here we are. As I said to you at the beginning, I've been an MP for over 30 years. I have never seen the Tories in such a mess. They are eating. They are eating themselves alive. <laughs> the last time I saw the Tories so hysterical, amongst themselves now, the last time I saw them in this sort of state of nervous prostration was in the John Major years, and that didn't end well for them. So precisely because the Tories are so weakened 
are in such a state, are so consumed by internal warfare, this presents a tremendous opportunity for the Labour movement. And I do not believe that ordinary Labour supporters will easily forgive Labour MPs that try and divide, try... I think that what ordinary Labour supporters want to see, even Labour supporters that didn't necessarily vote for Jeremy for the leadership, they can see the Tories are in crisis. They want the Parliamentary Labour Party and the party in the country to unite behind the excellent 2017 manifesto and to unite behind Jeremy. And let me finally say this. Um, my parents came to this country from Jamaica in the 1950s. Both my parents left school at 14. And it is something that a child of Jamaican immigrants who left school at 14 could be Britain's next Home Secretary. <laughs> Finally, <laughs> I am someone who owes everything in life to the labour movement. It was socialist activists who worked with nationalists in the Caribbean and Africa to make sure these countries could be free. The TUC worked with trade unions in Jamaica between the wars. So it was socialist activists who helped people in former colonies to be free. I'm a child of the welfare state. Free orange juice. Who remembers the free orange juice? Cod liver oil. Yeah. And see how young we look on it. Hey. I'm a child of the welfare state. Free orange juice. Free cod liver oil. Free university education. <laughs> When people talk about tuition fees, if my father, who left school at 14 and who worked in a factory all his life, had been told that his daughter, in order to go to university, would have to incur these levels of debt, he would have said no. It's not a cruel man, but he would have said no. And I have I voted against tuition fees under Tony Blair, and I've continued to do so because I am not prepared to pull the ladder up after me. I owe everything in life to the Labour movement, and it's a Labour leader that's made me Shadow Home Secretary. So my commitment to Labour movement politics is absolute. The Labour movement is the engine of advancement for ordinary people of all colours and in the working class. It is the Labour movement which is the last and best hope of working people and under the leadership of Jeremy Corbyn, I look forward to a Labour government that will deliver for working people in a way they haven't seen for very many years. Thank you for coming this evening. <laughs>
Fantastic. I want to say some thank yous, and then we're going to say good night. But when we do, the struggle will need to continue on. You will need to continue to inspire us, motivate us, hold us to account, and we will continue to try and do the same for you. Because this is a fight. Because the difference between progressives and socialists is progressives think that things can only get better. Socialists understand that we have to organize. We have to fight. We have to be wary of the far right. Far right. We have to be wary of the traitors within. So, I always think progress is an interesting phrase. As someone said to me earlier on, it's the last thing you want to hear when you come out of the doctor's surgery. I'm afraid your results are not good, it's progressed. Anyway, I want to thank Alistair, Emily, Matt and Lee, who have helped organise this event and continue... And, and they continue to help the day-to-day -day work of the Socialist Campaign Group because the reality is behind MPs there are teams of people working hard to make sure it all comes together. I want to thank the World Transformed, all the organisers here at this venue. The chair of the Australian Labour Party was here this weekend and she last was here at Labour Party conference in 2014. And she says, she said to me, it is totally transformed. The atmosphere has changed and it is because of you and it is because of the world transformed. So thank you. So, from us tonight, have a very good night, safe travels and continue fighting.